Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us on today's webinar, Getting Started in Digital Forensics. My name is Hunter Reed, and I will be helping moderate today's webinar. We will introduce Keytron in just a few moments, but first I would like to explain a few tips to make this webinar more interactive and engaging experience. As listeners, you are on listen-only mode. This means that you're muted, but you're more than welcome to ask questions at any time by typing them using the control panel's question feature. We'll save some time at the end to have Keytron answer your questions, and if we don't get to all of them, we'll make sure to personally follow up by emailing you an answer. If you're looking for CPEs, this webinar may qualify. After the webinar is over, you will receive a follow-up email that will include the email address and form to fill out in order to receive a completion certificate. You will then be able to send that certificate to your certifying body. Remember to check with your certifying body to check if you meet requirements. They can vary. The follow-up email will also include a copy of this webinar and the webinar slides. Now let's move on and introduce our speakers. We're excited to have Keytron back with us today to teach us a little bit about digital forensics. Keytron has done a few webinars with us in the past and always offers valuable contemporary insight into the world of cybersecurity. Keytron Evans is regularly engaged in training, consulting, penetration testing, and incident response for government, Fortune 50, and small businesses. In addition to being the lead author of the best-selling book, Chained Exploits, Advanced Hacking Attacks from Start to Finish, you will see Keytron on major news outlets such as CNN, Fox News, and others on a regular basis as a featured analyst concerning cybersecurity events and issues. For years, Keytron has worked regularly as both an employee and consultant for several intelligence community organizations on breaches and offensive cybersecurity and attack development. Keytron also provides world-class training for the top training organizations in the industry. Jeff Peters is the product manager for InfoSec training, including both InfoSec Flex, boot camps, and our new InfoSec skills on-demand training platform. He'll be helping me moderate today's webinar. Today, they will be diving into digital forensics and how it relates to careers, education, and training in cybersecurity. Jeff, why don't you go ahead and get us started? Hey, thanks, Hunter. Uh, great to be here and great to have Keytron back to discuss digital forensics with us. Uh, Keytron, I thought we could start by giving an overview of the different types of forensics out there. You know, here at InfoSec, you teach a few different courses on different types of forensics, such as computer, mobile, network forensics. Uh, so maybe we could briefly explain the different types of digital forensics and, and how they relate to when you're conducting investigations. Yeah, absolutely, Jeff. Thanks a lot. So um, computer forensics is really where a lot of it all started. When we, when we think about digital forensics, if you look at the things listed here, a computer was, you know, one of the first things, at least on the consumer side that we had access to, you know, not everybody had a net, a network or access to a network uh, 40 years ago, but there were, you know, computers that were main parts of mainframes and things like that. So when we look at computer forensics, that's really the, the foundation of it all and where it all started. I think the very first um, computer forensics program was actually written by uh, an IRS special agent, Department of Treasury special agent that was trying to prosecute a, um, some tax case with some big corporation, right? So it was a white collar thing. So computer forensics is where it started. And nowadays when we say computer forensics, we're mostly talking about dealing with memory and hard drive. So uh, is there any evidence or any data on the hard drive that can prove a case or help us prove a case? And is there anything in memory uh, on that computer that was left over from some recent attack or whatever the case may be that can help us prove a case? Um, when we look at mobile forensics, that's definitely a more uh, recent innovation. Because if you think about it, once upon a time, uh, if you look at your mobile phone, like your cell phone, when phones first came out, they were primarily used for what? You know, we used to just talk on them, right? Like, if you think about how you utilize your phone, we primarily use them to talk. And then we migrated from that to we do everything but talk on it. Like, I rarely actually have a conversation uh, on my cell phone now. And I think most of us fall in that same category. We do social media, we check emails, and we play games on these things more than we do anything else. And another important thing we do on them is actually look for directions and use it for GPS. 
So long story short is these mobile devices, phones and things like that are just little treasure troves of uh, digital evidence. So this is what this has a lot to do with the huge uptick in the relevance and importance of mobile forensics. So when we say mobile forensics, we're primarily talking about cell phones, um, iPads and tablets and things like that. Network forensics is really, you look at, you're doing forensics on how all these other things communicate, right? So cell phones communicate via towers and, and packets. Computers communicate over networks via packets. So network forensics is really looking at the communication between devices and getting data and uh, you know relevant evidence out of packets and that type thing as related to how stuff is communicating. Um, and it's really you know another area that's taken a lot more importance as of recent, because again, the more and more that we innovate in how we compute and do these things digitally, it changes where a lot of the evidence is. For example, a lot of the uh, child exploitation cases that I, that I've assisted on in the last five or six years, there's been a ton of evidence that's been gathered from network traffic. And primarily because if you look at the bad guys that are doing this stuff, a lot of them have wised up to the fact that, oh, we should be streaming this stuff. We shouldn't be downloading it and having evidence on our hard drive. We should just stream it. So, um, you know, whereas there used to be a treasure trove of evidence on hard drives, we don't see as much of it anymore. Uh, and, it, and we're definitely having to turn the memory and, and network to get that. And cloud forensics is, is obviously the newest uh, because there's a whole lot of questions, uh, and we'll get into some of that when we talk about some of the cloud stuff later, um, where, you know, there's questions about responsibility, you know, how much access is Amazon or Microsoft or Google going to allow you into that cloud environment to do proper forensics? What does proper forensics even mean anymore, right? Because cloud services have actually changed a lot of that. You know, we don't have physical access. Uh, to our computing devices anymore because a lot of those computing devices are really virtualized Amazon servers or virtualized, you know, uh, Microsoft Azure servers. So that's kind of the differences between uh, the four. Yeah, and then for those listening out there who are, you know, maybe thinking about getting into a career in digital forensics, um, are they likely to need to know all four of these different areas or is it a team of people that's investigating and you kind of specialize in one area? I was wondering if you could explain that a little. Yeah, generally you start off with, you know, with one specific area and just because of how uh, integrated our environments are now, you will end up touching on uh, kind of all of them at some point, but there are definitely people that specialize in certain areas, you know, like for example, um, I started off my career as far as doing anything forensics with computer forensics and then slowly moved into mobile as that became a thing and uh, moved into network. And now I do probably more cloud, you know, I would say cloud and memory forensics uh, combined and I do just about anything else. So I think you could jump in at either, either one of these. Uh, a lot of people that I know that are, that are experts in different areas, a lot of them kind of started with, uh, I guess you could say um, mobile forensics especially if you look at like law enforcement, because a lot of the people, the detectives and people like that in law enforcement, their first forensics thing that they had to do was get something off somebody's cell phone. And again, that's because a lot of the evidence nowadays in crimes uh, end up starting on cell phones. Mm -hmm. and, and is there one type of forensics that you enjoy doing the most? Um, I would probably say that uh, I think combining memory and network, I think I probably, you know, have like a hybrid. The combination of those two is probably my favorite um, because of the fact that, you know, the mobile is kind of getting to the point to where uh, if you don't have a way to get past some of the, the vendor protection, there's a limit as to how much you can get. So combining network and cloud and, and uh, memory is kind of where I focus a lot of my time now because there's been several cases where we've been able to get at iCloud accounts, for example, and get evidence out of there that we couldn't get off the phone because we couldn't get around the lock on the phone. But, you know, getting into iCloud sometimes proves to be easier than, for example, trying to get around the app or protection on the physical device. So it's just, you know, I find myself kind of gravitating more towards uh, the network and the cloud side. And also that's where a lot of my work lies too. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so uh, moving on to the forensics process uh, on the next slide, um, just 
wondering maybe if you could kind of walk through, uh, I guess, as I understand it, as, as far as I understand it, this is, you know, the basic forensics process that, you know, works for a lot of investigations. So uh, could you maybe explain, you know, each of those steps and, you know, what someone who has a career in digital forensics will actually do, like, as they go through an investigation? Yeah, sure. So generally, uh, if specifically, if you're, let's take computer, for example, if you're uh, approaching a site or something like that, um, there are some steps that you go through where you have to make sure that you're not investigating or you're trying to grab evidence. It's not, you know, going to be relevant to the case, but you have to balance that out with, you know, you don't want to exclude something that later turns out to be extremely relevant as well. So the first thing is identification, being able to identify what needs to be uh, investigated or gathered or, or tagged, for example. Uh, next, you want to go through a process of preserving data. And when we talk about digital evidence, that can be a very tough thing to do because when we look at hard drives and the, the risk of static electricity and all these other things that you can physically do, you know, to uh, disrupt or destroy evidence on these devices, you have to get into things like understanding what electrostatic bags and, uh, you know, bags that don't allow... Uh, wireless communications in and out of them like Faraday bags and things like that. Because if a suspect knows that their device is being seized, they might do something like try to wipe it. You know, there's all kinds of different things uh, like that that you have to consider as far as preservation. Uh, proper evidence collection, you know, when you collect it to put it somewhere to be analyzed later, that's part of preservation as well. Um, making sure that the evidence that you're collecting is actually uh, done in a forensically sound way. You know, I can't tell you the number of cases that I've been, been pulled into either halfway through it or last minute where they really messed up the preservation part and a lot of the evidence is completely not usable um, or definitely wouldn't be admissible in court because of how they collected it or how they preserved it. So um, those two, those first two steps, I would even say that the preservation and doing proper and forensically sound preservation and gathering is more important than just about anything else in these phases. Because if you don't preserve it or you don't maintain the forensics integrity, everything else that you do after that is kind of useless. You know, you could be the best analyzer and the best hard drive analyst person in the world. But if you're working with data or forensics evidence that may have been tainted because the integrity wasn't uh, maintained on it, then it's going to be useless. So I always tell people when I teach, you know, uh, gathering evidence and things like that is the only thing you can't come back from is if you mess up the collection and preservation, because if you mess that up, everything else from that point on is going to be flawed. If you go to the analysis part, for example, and you miss something or you don't find something, well, you can always go back and find it, you know, whereas with the preservation part, you can't undo that mistake that you made to make that evidence inadmissible. Uh, extracting the information is basically, you wanna make sure you follow proper methodology for that as well. And you have to be careful because with the powerful tools that are out there now, uh, we always say with great power comes great responsibility. A couple of things can happen and I've seen this, you can set your extraction tools to be extremely sensitive because you don't want to miss any little smidgen of evidence, but also doing that could make the extraction take exponentially longer, right? So you might say, I want to, I got Jeff's hard drive and I want to get every image thumbnail that's bigger than one KB. Well, if you set your tool to that setting, for one, it's going to take, you know, probably 10 times as long as, as if you use what something that we would commonly use like 12 KB or something like that. And then on top of that, you're going to have sometimes so much digital evidence now that you're never going to be able to get through all of it and analyze it. So um, that's another part that's important as far as you actually getting through a case. And then of course the analysis, uh, you want that always to be non-biased. And then probably the second most important part, almost as important as not messing up the collection and preservation is the reporting. Because if you do everything else right and your report doesn't clearly reflect your findings in a clear and concise way, then it might be viewed upon as bad or frowned upon and even may not be admissible because, you know, a judge might decide that your report has no relevance to the case because of how poorly you wrote the report. And I've actually seen that happen on a few cases. So all of these steps are important and, you know, just getting them kind of nailed down 
and getting hands on with the processes is what really what makes it uh, makes you good at it. Yeah. Now, does every forensics investigation pretty much follow these same steps? You know, I'm thinking back on the last slide. We we're talking about you know mobile and cloud and different types of forensics. So, um, obviously, over your career, has has there been a, a shift at all with, with these new technologies into the way you conduct forensics, or maybe with more emphasis on on different steps or more challenges for some of those steps? Yeah, you generally still follow the same uh, process here, but what ends up happening a lot of times is when you come into cases now, let's say, because you can't, we can't even just say forensics anymore or digital forensics, because the truth of the matter is, is there's digital forensics for cases where we might be trying to prosecute someone, right? Like if it's a child exploitation, human trafficking, murder, or something like that, then we're trying to prosecute someone. But what we also have to consider is a lot of the investigations are hinged on, you know, supporting incident response. There's been a data breach or something like that. And most of our customers that we do incident response for, they're, you know, if you were to rate on a prioritization table, how high they prioritize being able to prosecute somebody, it's usually really, really low down the prioritization chart. Like they're really just trying to do business continuity and be able to get back to operational state, find out root cause, make sure it doesn't happen again, uh, those things. So your forensics approach might not change, but your forensics focus changes. Right. So that would a lot of times affect how much time you spend on each one of these phases. So I don't think the phases change that much, but I think your focus in each phase changes based on uh, what type of case it is, uh, because we always want to maintain integrity of evidence and, and that type of thing. But when we're looking at a hack or data breach, you know, a lot of times you that's kind of out the window uh, because you might not even have any integrity to maintain. For example, if if it's a cloud server that's been compromised, you can't really get a forensically sound image of that hard drive anymore because you don't have physical access to it. So the best you'll have is like a logical image uh, and a memory dump. And these things are, since that VM is constantly running, you know, you have a, a hard drive that you're gonna have a hard time being able to verify integrity on. So it's really just at that point investigating for the sake of finding out root cause and eventually eradicating whatever that threat is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you've been teaching these courses for a while. So uh, just wondering, like, as you teach, is there any one of those steps that students have the most difficulty, you know, trying to, you know, either understand conceptually or the actual process of it? Yeah, I think definitely the, because ironically, you know, the collecting, like where you do the preservation, you know, you take images and stuff like that. While that's the most critical, it's also the easiest, right? Because once you remember these these two or three critical things that you never, ever, ever do and the two or three things that you always have to do. Uh, once you get that down to a process, you're not likely to mess that up. Uh, but the part where I find that students uh, have the most challenges in the analysis because there's so much to analyze and it's, and when we're doing analysis, you have these tools that's gonna spit out all this information for you, but you still need considerable amount of skills to process that information and make it into a report that's useful to someone, right? So because a lot of it's really, really technical and to take that and convert it into something that someone that's not technical can understand, I find that a lot of students have challenges with that part. Either they're not technical enough to get it or they're so technical that they're not good at, you know, putting together that non-technical report for uh, case findings and that type thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, so, so moving on to some more general forensics career kind of discussion. Uh, this is, you know, one of the slides that I was most interested to, to hear your thoughts on today because, you know, as whenever I go to, you know, like local chapter events for, you know, InfoSec professionals or, you know, people just send us questions or, you know, uh, you know want to know more stuff about InfoSec careers, uh, that's always one of the big questions we get is, you know, how do I get started in this career or how do I change this career or how to how does it fit into the overall picture? Uh, so I was wondering if you could, you know, touch on that a little bit, you know, maybe um, different types of, of forensics careers out there, whether they're entry level or mid level or, you know, kind of just how they fit into the overall picture and overall teams that are out there. Yeah, absolutely. So to what I've seen, at least in the industry, you know, most people that are doing forensics come from one of two backgrounds, either they were doing pen testing or some other uh, cybersecurity role and they work their way into uh, 
uh, doing something forensics, or they come from a law enforcement background. So they already have investigative skills, uh, some analysis skills that they just translate it into uh, doing, you know, computer forensics or cyber forensics. So I definitely think that those are the two primary places that we see people coming from as far as a background. But I also don't want to limit it. I think you can come from anywhere and do it. But uh, as we said, the bottom there, skills do carry over. But also, I want to point out that, you know, to be a good pen tester or a good hacker, you have to have some decent forensic skills because a big part of pen testing, right, is covering tracks. A big part of hacking is covering tracks to where you want to make it to where forensics is hard, you know. And if you don't understand how forensics work, then you are not going to be very good at making forensics difficult for a seasoned forensics person. So I think that to be a good pen tester, you need, you know, forensic skills. And I think really to be a good forensics person in this day and age, you have to have some pretty significant skills and understanding of how attacks work and pen testing and that type of thing. Because essentially, if you're going to be doing forensics as part of an incident response effort, or even as part of a threat hunting effort, for example, you know, you're going to need to have an understanding of how these threat actors operate. Otherwise, you don't even really know what you're looking at. Like you can collect the evidence, but you don't know what you're looking at. You can't piece it together. So I think it goes hand in hand. And I don't want to limit people to, to think that you really have to come from one to the other. It's just that wherever you start, you're going to always have to round it out uh, to really be good at whichever one of these careers you pick. Uh, and forensics is no different. You know, you want to have other skills. I mean, the day and age of where you can make a living just doing hard drive forensics, I think those days are numbered. So you're going to definitely have to step it up some. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And curious about entry level roles in forensics. Uh, I mean, you talked about how you need a, a good amount of experience, in different things and, and how those skills fit into a lot of different areas. But uh, for example, if you're hiring, you know, someone maybe a little more more new to the field for a forensics role. I mean, I guess one, are there roles out there that are more entry level? Um, and two, you know, what would be kind of the minimum that, that you would be looking for for someone to go into one of those roles? Yeah, I think the entry level stuff starts a lot with uh, just doing collections is what we call it in the, in the industry where, you know, if I hired somebody new, your primary job is probably going to be to go out and either do collections or assist with collections. Because as we said, that's the most critical part, but it's also the easiest to master because it's, you know, if you're doing hard drive collections or mobile device collections, once you remember to always plug in a hardware write blocker between that device and your imaging machine and get those steps down, it's really hard to mess that up. So as an entry level person, you're going to get really, really good at doing collections, you know, just collecting the evidence and bringing it back to the lab for the more seasoned people to do the examination and the uh, analyst type work. And then as you get comfortable with collections and you understand that, you know, there's opportunity for you to assist with the analyst, you know, with the people doing incident response and stuff like that, and eventually move into those roles. So, and I, and I think anyone could literally go and if you got the right tools, you could start from nothing and get pretty good at collections, uh, you know, in a very short amount of time. So I think that's a good entry point for people uh, if you know nothing else. Yeah, that's, that's perfect. I was actually just about to ask you that, you know, if, if someone's listening and they really want to get started in forensics, obviously, you know, they could take one of your courses, which we'll talk about in a minute. But um, you mentioned different tools. Are there like free open source tools that someone can go use to, to get started and, you know, kind of get their feet wet with this kind of stuff? Or do they have to use paid tools? Can you talk a little oh, about, yeah. about that? Absolutely. You can definitely get. Uh, pretty good with some of the free tools. Uh, some of the ones we like is Autopsy. Uh, it's a good free open source tool uh, that you can go out and download and use for free. Uh, there's one called Foremost that we like to use to carve data uh, out of hard drive images and things like that. And these are tools that we that we still use, even though we spend lots of money on tools, um, you know, paid for tools, we still use a lot of open source tools in our practice just because they're, they're the best at doing some things. So definitely uh, to start with, you want to have autopsy foremost. Uh, there's a tool called Scapel, you know, for network forensics, there's a tool that, that we always use called Network Miner, uh, Wireshark. You definitely want to have that volatility. 
uh, you want to have in your docket for memory forensics. Uh, there's also a tool called Dump It that we use to actually do a memory dump, you know, off of a machine to be able to do memory forensics. So those are some of like the key open source or free things that you can go get and start with right away. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, so moving on to the next slide, I uh, just wanted to touch base a little bit about, you know, your course that you actually teach. Obviously, as we mentioned before, you teach a, a few different forensics related courses. Uh, so can you give the listeners just a sense of, of what a boot camp is like and, you know, a typical day and the kinds of things that they would learn in, in one of those courses? Yeah, so we, we you know, um, there's a couple of us that teach this course from time to time. And the thing is, is generally what we do is we start off the first day dealing with a lot of the legal stuff just to kind of uh, get that out of the way because it's it's very not hands-on it's not technical but it's something that's important uh, that we have to kind of get out there so we start off the first day talking about legal stuff and then we move into chain of custody uh, where you get to see what chain of custody forms look like and I even hand out you evidence hard drives and things like that and you have to document that and start a chain of custody for the evidence that I'm handing over to you. So students actually get, you know, hands-on experience for like taking photos of evidence, documenting what they have, uh, you know, putting serials and stuff like that in the, in the chain of custody documents. And you walk away with chain of custody templates, which is a, which is a good thing because you have something to actually start with. Um, and then we quickly move right into the technical depth of it. You know, you will actually take an image of a hard drive um, and then, then you'll analyze that image and then we'll move later in the week, probably the midday Tuesday or, uh, you know, late Tuesday afternoon into doing some memory forensics uh, to where you can get hands on that. And then we move into network forensics and then we always do these kind of capture the flag uh, type you know, you can work on it in the evening if you want types of exercises where you take the things that you learn during the day and you, uh, you know, try to solve kind of real world problems, forensics problems with those skills that you gain throughout the day. So we create, you know, PCAT files and traffic files and memory forensics or, or memory images and hard drive images that you get to play with to see if you can answer questions and things like that. So we make it very real world and very hands on. Uh, and we and the Flex Center is kind of like our central point for all that because all the courseware, all of the pre-recorded videos, and everything like that is right there in the Flex Center, so you don't have to worry about losing anything, you know, losing uh, a, a a book or anything like that because all of that stuff is provided digitally right inside Flex here, and that makes it useful for students because some people will come to class and they'll say, hey, you know, I can't come back at six because I got to take the kids to dance or whatever, uh, but I'm going to come work on this at 8.30 tonight. And, you know, they have that flexibility because now it's all, you know, right here in Flex. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Um, so we're going to go on to the Q&A portion uh, shortly, but before that, uh, we're going to have a, a live forensics demo from Keychan. Um, so I know that's that's been a, a big hit on some of the previous webinars that you've done with us. So um, I guess, Keychan, could you give us a brief explanation of each of these uh, potential demos? And then uh, Hunter will launch a poll so that the viewers out there can vote on which one they, they'd like to see today. Yeah, absolutely. So the Cloud Forensics, you know, I've actually got a, uh, a few virtual machines running inside a cloud environment standing by. And I'll just show how... Um, you know, we're able to actually uh, get a memory dump off that machine that's in the cloud and then find something malicious in it. And actually what I'll do is I'll attack the machine first, you know, this, so that there is something malicious on it. And then we'll extract the memory dump and, and use uh, volatility to pull that malicious binary out of memory and let you see how we can take it and, you know, prove that it's malicious based on the fact that we pulled it right out of memory. Uh, and this is useful for things like root kits and stuff that you that your traditional tools, your virus scanners and things like that just can't find. All right. And then the network forensics, uh, kind of the same logic here, except we will take a packet capture, you know, of traffic, and we will pull something malicious out of the traffic. Uh, and that's kind of how you can see how that works, because a lot of times in environments, hackers are good at covering their tracks. So they will wipe stuff off the hard drive, make sure that there's nothing left there. But if you have those packets, a lot of times you can get 
what it is you're looking from just from the packets. So that's kind of the primary differences between the, the two there. And, you know, we can, uh, we're allowing people to vote on those. Yep, it's, it's pretty close right now. It's about 50-50. So I'm going to give you guys just a few more seconds to uh, finish voting on the poll here. Yeah, and, and while we wait for people to vote, uh, maybe you could explain um, some of the other types of exercises that they might do in, over, the, over a course. Uh, maybe besides these two, is there any other interesting demos or hands-on stuff that they get to try? Yeah, um, it's actually, even though it's a forensics course, one of the things that they will get to do is you will get to do some attack stuff because part of the goal of this is you kind of have to do some attack stuff to know what the attacks look like and to know um, kind of how to, to look for it and what to look for, you know, whether you're doing memory, um, hard drive or whatever the case may be. So we do, you do actually learn about basic exploitation. Now we don't spend a lot of time on it like we would in a uh, ethical hacking course, but you will absolutely run some exploits. Like you'll be exploiting yourselves so that you can investigate yourselves because we've we found out that's really one of the best ways to learn how to investigate attacks is, is be part of creating those attacks. So you definitely do uh, some interesting things like that as well. All right, and it looks like the cloud forensics is the winner. So Keytron, you want to go ahead and take it away? Yeah, so I'm going to just um, share my uh, screen here. Are you ready for me to take over that? Yeah, go for it. All right. So basically um, what we have here is this is just a Kali uh, virtual machine or Kali environment that we're going to be doing the attack from. All right. And I'll make the attack quick because we want to focus on the forensics part. And this will be the, the 2012 R2 server here that we will be uh, actually attacking. Right. So one of the challenges that's new for cloud that we've not really had to deal with a lot before is if there is an attack going on on this server, you can't walk into Amazon or walk into Microsoft Azure and say, we would like to take a physical memory dump of this server because this server really doesn't exist in terms of being a physical device. You know, even in your traditional data centers, you could go into that data center and at least plug into that rack or even image the entire you know, that entire cluster, uh, if you needed to do that. Whereas now when you look at the cloud side, you don't have that capability. But one of the most important things, and you know, we're kind of, we kind of have a strong incident response uh, data breach kind of focus on this particular demonstration, is if you go into a breach situation, one of the first things that you have to remember, and we teach this in class, is something called the order of volatility, which means you always want to collect the most volatile evidence first. And by volatile, we mean evidence that's most likely to either A, change or not be there anymore. And, you know, the, the number one place that is, is memory. So you want to be able to get whatever's in memory out first, because whatever's on the hard drive is likely to still be there. And even if they erase it, then, you know, we have forensics techniques to recover it. But when you look at memory, once that machine shuts down, whatever was in memory is gone forever. There's no magic to get it back or anything like that. So um, we're gonna show like how in a cloud environment, this server, which is 103, is gonna get attacked here. We're gonna do a memory dump and show you how we can extract out of memory uh, the malicious uh, thing that is the attack that we're doing here. So the first thing an attacker might do is scan that server, which I think is 103 and you know find vulnerabilities in it or look for services in this particular case we would they'd spend a lot of time doing reconnaissance and enumeration on each one of these services to see if they can map that to a vulnerability i'm just going to pretend we've done that process all right and now we've kind of narrowed our focus down to the service that's running on port 8081 for example we see that it says it might be black ice We'll do a little bit deeper probe on it with a version probe scan and find that um, it's actually not black ice. And keep in mind, this particular 
um, you know, service that we're interacting with, all of this interaction, these scans, this is generating evidence too. There are things in memory that are related to these port scans as well, you know, that you can pull out. So we see that it's running that service. A thing that an attacker might do is now that they know the service, they might go out to the internet and quickly look for vulnerabilities related to that service. So just showing you how easy this can be. Assuming I can spell Google. And I'm just gonna paste that right out of the, uh, the Nmap output there. Uh, as you can see, Nmap told us this. So we're just gonna literally copy that. and paste it right into Google and just add the word vulnerabilities to the end of it. And as you can see from that, there are several vulnerabilities that come back, you know, and they're all related, uh, you know, to the Regetto service, right? So what we're gonna do is search inside our exploit framework for that. We can see there are several exploits. So now we can go ahead and load our exploit framework and we're, we're gonna key on just that vulnerability. Now, if I were doing, you know, network forensics, I would probably have, you know, Wireshark and, or Splunk or something running on the victim side because we would be focusing on packets and the traffic that's about to be generated. But what we're gonna be looking at now is what happens in memory, you know, when this particular attack runs, uh, how it works, that type of thing, just from a memory forensics perspective. All right, so again, if we search for that term that we found, Regetto, on the internet, we can, we'll clearly see that there are, um, you know, exploits in here for it. And we're going to load that. I forgot to load my database, but we're good without it for now. All right, so we're gonna use that exploit. And you know, I don't want anybody to get caught up on the exploit here, um, you know, trying to like go find it or something like that, because the truth of the matter is, is there's always gonna be vulnerabilities for stuff. You know, there's always gonna be zero days. So there's really, uh, let's try that again. There's always going to be vulnerabilities out there that we can, um, you know, exploit. And then we'll set our target, or actually this machine I think is 102. That's 104. And then our target. And then the port that the service is running on. So, I mean, you know, just that quickly and keep in mind, it could be a lot quicker. I was, cause I was actually getting fat fingers there and I was explaining it as I'm going, but a real attacker would do, wouldn't go as slow as I was going because they're not trying to go at a speed that you can see it. They're just trying to get it done. So we're in there now and we can do things like take screenshots, um, you know, completely on that machine. You know, we can drop to a command shell and, and do commands. Uh, let's frame Jeff here because we all know he's like the top hacker in the world. So he's probably responsible for this. So we've created an account named Jeff, you know, on the system. And you do all kinds of other stuff. But now the key to that is if we go now to the victim. So let's say we're the victim. We're, we are in the middle of a data breach. We got called. And one of the first things that I'm going to tell my guys to do is you got to get a memory dump right away because whatever the attacker is doing is happening in memory. If they're extracting stuff, it's in memory. If they're 
writing stuff to the hard drive, there's evidence of that in memory. Whatever they're doing, programs run in memory. So whatever they're doing to it, there's gonna be pieces of that or evidence of it in memory. So I'm gonna use dump it here to get a memory dump. And it simply uh, you know, writes the whatever the contents of memory is right out to a file. And I've got it configured to write it to the desktop here so that we don't have to you know, go get it from somewhere else or something like that. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna analyze uh, that particular memory dump, which is right here with volatility. Now I'm gonna name it something other than this super long name uh, that it came up with for it, just so that I don't have to type this over again. We'll just call it Jeff Hack, since you know we know Jeff's the one that did the hack. And then from there, I'm going to uh, open a command prompt and have volatility simply view um, that particular uh, image there. So let's make this a little bit bigger. And make this bigger just in case you guys have small screens out there. Let's go 24. Let's spread this out a little bit. Just make it a little bit more aesthetic. All right, so if I run volatility, you know, like so, and you know what, let's rename that too, because that's a, a long name. So we're going to rename volatility to just vol.exe or something like that. It doesn't take up so much screen space. All right. So if I run volatility against that Jeff, you know, dot dump there, we tell it that's a file. And, you know, we can also, like if we wanted to, um, if we didn't know what the operating system was, you can actually run something called image scan against it and it would tell you what the operating system is. Now we don't really have to do that. We can just do dash as profile equals and we know what it is. And then we can test it by seeing if we can do a PS list, which basically just list, you know, uh, processors. And it doesn't like the profile. So let's just, let's do this and find out. Let it catch up with us here. All right, there we go. It's letting me type again now. So this process iterates over all of memory. And one thing you gotta be careful of is if it were a, like a, a, a big memory dump, like if it were like a 16 or a 32 gig memory dump, this process would take much, much longer to actually um, work there. So, you know, you would have to kind of tell it that and give it time to finish. Now this one's taken a little bit of time because it, again, this is a, I think a eight gig dump. So it's gonna take it about two or three minutes here to finish up the process of identifying for us what the uh, profile is. Now, if you're in a cloud environment, you know, again, understand this is, this is one of the primary ways that you're going to have to do memory dumps. You know, you won't be able to, to um, go and physically plug into it. 
or any of that stuff that we're used to doing, uh, because this is kind of how you'd have to do it. You know, you'd have to have a tool like this, or if you're a big organization with lots of money, you would have, you could have, you know, most of the forensic suites that we have out there have these memory agents that you can run on the devices and they will actually go out and, you know, uh, do the scan for you and tell you, um, how to get the dump and that type thing. The key to that though, is you already have these tools or these suites running before you actually need to do a memory grab. You know, you and having to come in after the fact and do it actually uh, makes it take a little bit longer. All right, so we just, we just have to kind of wait on this to finish here. Well, we do have a few questions we could potentially get to while we're waiting, if it's going to take a couple minutes. Yeah, go for it. Um, yeah, so Lori, she was asking about uh, security clearances and, and if anything like that is required for some of these positions, and, and if so, you know, what level would, would be needed? Um, if you're working in the government, uh, they're going to require a clearance, you know, to, uh, you know, if you're going to be working in an area that's either deals with secret or top secret information or something like that. But you can definitely have a successful career um, in this field without ever having a clearance. Like you don't have to have a clearance to do this kind of work. It's just that if you're gonna do it in a government facility, most of them are gonna require that you have a uh, clearance. So that's the answer to that. Yeah, and what about um, specific certifications? Like I know, I know, for example, the DOD has their their certain requirements for for different certifications. Are there any forensic certifications that fit into that, or just certifications in general that that you, as a, a for someone who's hiring for these positions, would be looking for? Yeah, I know they're trying to get CHFI on that eighty five seventy list, but I'm not I'm not familiar with a lot of forensic specific certifications. One of the things about forensic certifications is a lot of the certs are vendor specific, right? For example, NCASE has their suite of NCASE certifications and, uh, you know, FTK has their access data certifications. And those certs are mostly, you know, specific to those specific, uh, you know, tool sets or products that you're using. But there's not a lot of vendor neutral forensic certs that are, that are on the 8570 uh, required list. Mm-hmm. And we've had a couple of people uh, chime in asking about salary. You know, obviously that varies widely depending on position and location or about just wondering if you have any thoughts you could share around, you know, salary for different types of positions. Oh, sure. Sure. Um, so it depends on what kind of forensics you're doing. You know, if you're calling yourself just a forensics person uh, and you're doing just forensics, you know, you're not going to be making uh, what we would call top end, um, you know, uh, can cybersecurity salaries there. But if you're doing forensics and that's one of your core skills, uh, you can definitely use that, you know, as a way to uh, increase your value in an organization. But if you're just doing like, for example, hard drive forensics, um, you know, you can look to make anywhere from, uh, some of the low end stuff I've seen starts as low as uh, like 70,000 a year. But then I've seen some also go up to, um, you know, over a hundred thousand a year as entry level. And it really depends on what the requirements are and uh, what it is they're wanting you to do. I know there was one particular um, person that I mentored and she was, you know, really new to the field. She didn't have any, uh, real experience or anything like that, but she ended up getting a uh, a job paying I think like a hundred and sixty thousand a year as a entry level forensics person. But um, you know she was actually doing it uh, for a large law firm, so she was took the ro took on the role of being the forensics person for a large law firm, uh, and she was responsible for gathering all their information and that type of thing. So that ended up being a, a different situation, I guess you could say. All right, so this image is not. Yeah, um, so Kevin here, he commented that there's a typo. It says PS lit instead of PS list. 
Oh yeah, that'll definitely do it. <laughs> Thanks, Kevin. <laughs> yeah. I told you, see, my, my biggest problem in forensics is my uh, spelling. You know, that's definitely going to be the crux of it. So all PS list does is it just shows you it's the same as if you went to a machine and you type, you went to task manager and looked at running processes. But keep in mind, we're doing this to a machine that we don't have access to. All we have now is a memory dump. So we're, we're doing this kind of post-mortem, you know, after we've went away from the machine and that type thing but we can still get a good list of running processes and that type thing. And what I'm gonna show you here in just a second is how we can not only see running processes, but we can see you know, which processes are childs or children, uh, as I should say, of other processes. Now, obviously right away we can see that you know, something, this looks a little weird and there might be a few other processes. And what's important is, let's look at these from a child standpoint so we'll do that by doing something called uh, PS tree. And what PS tree does for us is, is not only will we see the processes, but we will see their relationships to other processes. And that will be a lot uh, that will help us a lot as far as indicating, you know, what's actually going on and what spawned that weird process, because we know that we don't have any legitimate processes named uh, slqrckx.exe or whatever that string was. So what PS tree will do for us is let us kind of historically see where that process got launched from. Like in other words, what launched it or who launched it. And that can be very useful uh, for figuring out what we're gonna do. Now, once we see that in this tree view here, uh, we're gonna extract that binary right out of memory Remember, we, we're pretending now we don't have access to the physical machine. We just got a memory dump. But this process that I was talking about, this guy right here, right, that's the one that we're not sure about. We can see that it's got a PID of 3996, all right? 3996 is its PID, so we'll need to remember that. But we can also see that it's not its own process. It's running as a child of WScript. And then WScript was launched by hfs.exe. So what is hfs.exe? Well, it turns out that is the actual web server, this guy right here, that was exploited or attacked. So we could even from a memory dump perspective kind of form some hypothesis that since this rogue process is running as a grandchild of this parent process that we know about, that's probably the service that was exploited. And you might wanna check it to see if there's any missing patches or whatever the case may be. Now, the real sweet part of this is we can now basically tell volatility that we want to actually do a dump of just that process, not of everything, but just that process. And we can dump that process right out of uh, this memory dump here. You know, in other words, we don't know anything about it but we know we wanna dump it out. Now, what I would caution you guys on when doing this particular thing is keep in mind, this is a rogue process. It is a malicious process. So if this is a real environment and you're dumping a malicious process, what you don't wanna do is dump this process onto a server that, that you don't want malicious stuff to be running on. So again, what power comes responsibility. So I'm gonna go ahead and show you how to do it. And this will be the end of our kind of our demo here. I'm gonna do proc dump, which is a volatility plugin. I'm gonna tell it dash D and I'm gonna have it dump it right to, let's just create a folder on the desktop name. Uh, we'll call it Jeff stuff or something like that. All right, and we're gonna have volatility dump that malicious binary right there. So the directory is gonna be Jeff stuff. And the process that we don't want to dump is the malicious one or the one that we think is malicious, which is 3996. All right. So we run that. And it'll take volatility a minute to carve it out. So it'll carve it out and it'll tell us, hey, we did it and we wrote it out to the directory on the desktop named Jeff stuff. And we'll be able to, that, at that point, go and either A, execute that binary to see what it does, which I don't recommend that if you're not in a specific 
malware reverse engineering sandbox environment. Or what I'm going to do is we'll upload it to VirusTotal and you'll see that VirusTotal tells us that absolutely uh, that process is bad. Now there's some other stuff that we can look at. For example, there's a, a plugin that I was going to show you called Command or Connect Scan that will literally show you that any connections, uh, let's actually do that. You know, coming from this thing is actually uh, coming from that binary. And then while that's running, we'll go look at the binary that we extracted. So if we check the desktop and look in the Jeff stuff folder, lo and behold, we have now this binary in there. Now, again, this is very dangerous if you're, if you're not in a sandbox environment because you don't know what it is you just extracted. But I'm just gonna go to virus total and upload that binary because virus total is basically a combination of like 50 different top AV vendors that have their engines accessible. And we're just gonna load that binary right out of there or that executable. And what we'll find is virus total will tell us like, hey, this is what we think it is, you know, and based on that, you can see definitely as it scans there, it's gonna turn out that most of them say it's something malicious. Now, what I wanna show you with con scan is you can clearly see that with con scan, there are actually established connections based on that malicious process. For example, if we looked at all the ones that say established, about three of those would show up as being that specific process that we were just looking at. You know, the weird one that had the name of, uh, you know, a bunch of letters and characters. So you can see connections related, you know, to that process as well. And we could even specify that PID and basically ask volatility, are there any connections based on just that PID? Now we can clearly see a connection out to the bad guy here on port 8080, but there's also some stuff on port 8081, which is actually where the uh, command shell went across. So while that's done, let's go back and see what virus total had to tell us. And as you can see here, it, it you know, it's red all over the place. So they clearly all say it's really, you know, it's bad. Red means bad. Now, if you look on this list and you see your AV or HIPS product saying that it's green, then that might be of a little bit of concern. Um, for example, we can see that Panda says it's fine. Malwarebytes says it's fine. But I'm telling you for sure it's not fine because we just put it there. So, uh, but if you can see all the other ones like McAfee and, and some of these others here, they all said it's bad. Um, and that's how we can take a machine that we're not sure what's going on with it. Uh, we can clearly see from that memory dump that something's going on. We were able to extract the process, put it on a safe environment to see that it's bad. And uh, that's the demo. Awesome. Um, yeah, I think we have time just real quick to maybe take one or two questions before we wrap up. Um, so let me just peek through here, see if there's any ones that stand out. Um, so I guess, yeah, yeah, kind of related to the demo that you just showed us. We have one from Kelvin. Um, he was asking, um, can attackers do or use anything to thwart the use of these memory dumping tech tactics? Yeah, there are some things that they do. So, so one of the big things now is something called file less malware. That's F-I-L-E-L-E-S-S -S -S malware, where instead of actually putting, you know, a functioning binary or functioning piece of code, they just manipulate the things that Windows already has in memory and use those things to do whatever it is they need to do. And that is a common thing now. And that's much, much harder to detect with the memory dump. But you can still detect it. You just have to to know what threads and what handles to look for in memory as far as how these built-in Windows APIs are being manipulated and used. But it's much harder for sure. Um, yeah, I see we have a, a few other questions. Um, we'll probably just take one more quick, uh, but if you did submit a question, we can uh, definitely follow up with you uh, via, via email after, after the webinar is over. Uh, so the last question we'll take here is, um, Someone you know, says they don't really have a lot of experience in the field, or actually they say they have no experience whatsoever. And you know, looking at your demo and seeing what you're talking about, it says it sounds like it's uh, primarily for those who are already doing some form of IT related work. So if someone has you know, basically absolutely zero experience in IT, 
Um, is there any recommendations you have for them, you know, to, to get started if they have an end goal of, of being involved in forensics? And do you have a, a timeline of how long it could take to kind of go from zero to, to a, a job? Yeah, well, definitely you want to, um, if you have no IT experience, right, that's something different. Like you want to jump into A+, plus, Net+, plus, Security+, plus, uh, Network+, plus, things like that to kind of get yourself acclimated to IT. Definitely, I don't recommend someone come from no IT experience at all into forensics. Um, but, you know, if you have some IT experience, I think that the transition to forensics is not that big of a curve at all. Um, so, you know, if you're new to IT in general, go start looking at the A-plus syllabus, look at the Network Plus, the Security Plus uh, syllabus. And even if you don't take a class, just go and study those subject areas uh, to where you get comfortable with it. Set up a wireless network at home, like do basic tech stuff to get yourself in the IT before you try to jump right into forensics. I definitely don't recommend coming into forensics out of with no IT experience at all. I mean, people have done it, but it's a much, much bigger uh, learning curve. All right, and that'll do it for uh, today's webinar. We are out of time. So thank you to Keytron for joining us, and thank you to everyone else who uh, submitted questions and participated along. Um, as we mentioned earlier, you can watch for a recording in your email coming soon, um, along with uh, cer uh, any CPE certificates if you need them, uh, and a copy of the slides and all that stuff. Uh, if you'd like more information about digital forensics right away, feel free to check out our website, infosecinstitute.com, or if you'd like to speak with someone uh, about digital forensics courses, you can call the number there on the screen. Um, there will be a short survey that should appear on your screen. Um, if you, we'd appreciate it if you take a few minutes just to fill that out because that helps us provide you with better webinars going forward in the future and, and, and uh, meeting your needs. Uh, if you have any other questions, feel free to direct them to info at infosecinstitute.com and we'll be sure to get back to you soon. Have a great rest of your day.